ladies and gentlemen, we are live! Lyrically, I'm untouchable, uncrushable. All right, it is Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time, uh, 8 p.m. over in the East Coast, and this is Punch the Face Radio. I am your host, Brandon Stubbs, uh, here to talk boxing as always, but... You know it's that special time. It's our fall fight extravaganza. So there's no way in the world I could do this show alone. With me is my my, my co-host tonight, my brother in boxing, the one and only curator of SaturdayNightBoxing.com, Adam Abramowitz. Adam, man, how you doing this evening? Good, Brandon. Uh, Happy to be here. Got a lot of great fights coming up in the next uh, two and some months. So it's a lot of great stuff to cover. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. So not only a part of our fight, uh, Fall Fight Preview uh, Extravaganza show, uh, we'll also be joined here in about 45 minutes by Austin Trout. He's going to be part of a triple header that we're going to talk about that goes down on Showtime October 14th. And then Carl Moretti, uh, the VP of Boxing Operations for uh, Top Rank, he's going to talk to us about what's going on with uh, Top Rank and what they're doing here 2017, first quarter 2018. Uh, but we're going to kind of dive right into um, the news of the day, Adam. And that is Deontay Wilder now has a new opponent uh, for his bout here on November the 4th. And it's not really what we thought or really wanted it to be. Yes, yeah, it uh, remains to burn. It's going to be a, a rematch of a fight from a few years ago. And I guess the irony of this fight being made is that Stavern had been installed by the WBC, Don King, um, as the number one contender without really doing anything since last fight. And this fight was so poor that Showtime didn't want to buy it. And so they came up with some step-aside policy where Stavern would be on the undercard against Dominic Brazil, and Wilder would be fighting Luis Ortiz. And that fight, both of those fights, I thought were really great fights, Um, you know, on different levels. Wilder-Ortiz would have matched... You know, two of, let's say, the top six heavyweights in the division. And Stavern in Brazil would be a great, I call them garbage fights. Like, B-level, you know, fantastic. Like, knockouts are going to happen. Like, that's a great fight for that level. And now we have two, I thought, good fights that are going to be gutted. And we're back to where we started. But now this is going to be on Showtime. And we're still missing a fighter for Brazil. So, you know, Wilder, you've got a feel for him. This is his third fighter who's now tested positive in the division. Um, you know, Wilder famously um, got out of a fight with Pavekin after Pavekin failed drug tests while Wilder was already in London uh, about to fly over to Russia to fight to face Pavekin. So, uh, you know, Wilder has been wanting to get these bigger opponents. I think he's been – he wants that glory, that recognition of being among the best. I think he sees a competition with Joshua – who's a, sh- a, sh- a superstar in England. And I think Wilder wants some of that glory and it's a really tough break for him. Uh, I know not all of his opponents have been the best, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, he has made those attempts uh, to fight better people. It just hasn't worked out. There's a lot of doping that's going involved um, in the heavyweight division. And even if Luis Ortiz failed this test because of blood pressure medications, blah, blah, blah. That's not why he failed an earlier test. And also, if you are taking those types of medicines, fill out the damn form. You know, that's what it's there for. Fill out the form. Have a medical reason for it. And so he didn't do that and suffered the consequences. Um, You know, there's a lot of hate for Wilder. There's a lot of victim blaming. People blame Wilder, always being protected and other guys ducking. How do do you view Wilder? I mean, obviously, it's, it's unfortunate that these fights have fallen through. But what's your sense on him in terms of, you know, how you view his career, what he wants, and, and, and how you view him in boxing. Well, unfortunately, all this is going on isn't his fault. Um, you know, he can only do what he can do. He's only going to fight the people they put in front of him. And this situation here with Stavern and now Luis Ortiz, not his fault. Uh, not his fault at all. So I can't blame him too much for that. The thing is, now he has to just go out and just continue to crush everybody he brings out in front of him because that's only what is going to shut the critics up, is continue to beat up the people they put in front of him until really there's going to be no one left except for 
Parker down under or Joshua over in the UK. I mean, it's, it's starting to kind of come to that conclusion to where he's having a tough time finding opponents who can stay clean. You know, the people they put in front of him, he's crushing them for the most part. I, I just tell him, you know, keep fighting your fight, keep doing your thing, keep fighting clean, and, you know, eventually he'll get the recognition he deserves. I just hope for his sake it's not, you know, at the latter end of his career. Uh, we ought to appreciate what he's doing now a little bit more than what we are as a masses. Do you think that the frustration with his career is hurting his performances in the ring? I mean, if you look at the fight with Gerald Washington, his last fight earlier in the year, yes, he got the knockout, but he was getting soundly outboxed in the first few rounds of that fight. Now, maybe Washington was a little better than we thought, but Wilder looked really listless during that fight. And you can't say he was saved by right hand Arsenal, but he was losing that fight. I mean, he was really competitive with Arthur Spilka until that knockout. I mean, do you think the problems with his career have hurt him in the ring? Is he regressing? Is he not that good? Uh, what's, what's going on with him from your assessment? I think some of it, he may just not be as motivated. You know, when you're facing sometimes lower competition, you know, we see this often in, in football. You know, sometimes teams play down to their competition, or we see it in basketball as well. You sometimes play down to your competition. You think, okay, on paper, I ought to be able to just beat this guy up, no problem. And you find yourself fighting to their their level. And you kind of see that at times with Wilder. It's almost like, you know, he's just so he, – he knows that he – you know, second he goes with one of those right hands and then a can opener happens, boom, it's over. But it just seems like he's kind of being more lethargic than what he really needs to be there in ring. And I think that's something he definitely needs to to focus and work on. That's going to be my fear here with the Severn Part 2 fight is, you know, is he going to start off lethargic? Is he guy going to be motivated because this isn't the opponent he originally wanted? Or is he going to be even more motivated because this is an opponent that really no one wanted to see? He wants to get him out of there, shut Severn up finally, and then possibly move on to bigger and better things after this bout. See, one of the things I noticed with Anthony Joshua's development is that for a long time he was fighting cans just like Wilder was. But Joshua took each opponent, I think, very seriously and made significant attempts to try and get better each time. And so by the time he's fighting Klitschko, even though he hasn't had a lot of great opponents whatsoever, you know, he has worked on a lot of the flaws he had, being a little too wide with his punches, you know, of, of moving his head a little bit more, of protecting his chin a little bit. I'm not going to tell you that Joshua solved all of those things, but I think he took each step along the way uh, as an opportunity to improve himself. And with Wilder, you know, it's almost like I have the right hand, that will bail me out, but I'm not seeing the, you know, tightening up his punches a little bit, the footwork, you know, he, he neglects the body sometimes, sometimes he's a left hook, sometimes he doesn't. I'm not seeing him taking each opportunity as a way to get better. And that is concerning. I'm not saying everybody is going to be at their top, you know, a game every fight, but you want to see people progressing in the right direction. I'm just not sure he's doing that. I don't know if he can put it all together. Maybe he needs to, maybe he needs the right opponent to put it all together, but that is concerning. I mean, is that, is that something that bothers you? You know, it's kind of a, one of those weird stigmas to kind of come along with PBC fighters. We see this a lot with a lot of those guys because sometimes they're just not active enough. And we see where they kind of – we see yeah. them in one fight and they kind of regress some. So it's weird to say, but I'm not totally surprised kind of given, you know, who he's working with and how active or inactive they are at times. So, you know, it is concerning, um, but I think it's something that we see after a couple of rounds – you know, he kind of pulls it together. But I, I just hope for his sake he doesn't get to off to one of these slow starts and one of these bouts coming up. And, you know, he's in too far of a hole or he gets hurt, gets himself hurt because he is starting off so slow he's just not into it. So he, he needs to get, you know, from opening bell, be woken up and be ready to fight because we've seen when he is on, he is, you know, arguably the best heavyweight in the world. So we just need to have him on from opening bell and not a couple of rounds into the fight to where he finally wakes up and realizes, hey, I'm in a heavyweight fight. So the first fight with Stavern was kind of interesting because it was the first time, I believe, that Wilder had gone the distance. Uh, he winds up winning a unanimous decision. You know, Stavern had a couple of good rounds early in the fight. I think it was the fourth and the fifth. Uh, he had about two or three very good rounds. Uh, after the fight, Stavern 
apparently checks into the hospital having all sorts of issues with dizziness and uh, apparently had all sorts of issues in training camp with dehydration. Um, a lot of people looked at the fight and they said, well, Stavern had a lot of success when he threw his shots. He just wouldn't open up. Um, what are we to take from that first fight? Uh, for me, it showed that Stavern, you know, had some tools and, and obviously he's knocked out Ariola twice. It's not like he's terrible. Uh, he just didn't have the physical conditioning and will to, to meet Wilder in the ring uh, for, for 12 full rounds. How do you see the rematch playing out? You know, Severn has to know that this is this is his last chance. So yeah, he's got to go for broke. He's got to be more active. Uh, that was one of the bigger complaints I'd had, that he just wasn't – he wasn't throwing enough punches. You've got to throw punches out there. That's the name of the game, and he just didn't throw enough, wasn't active enough. Uh, to win more rounds, because some of those rounds were close enough to where if he were more active, he would have won. You know, so um, I, I think in this case, he's going to come out, and he's going to be a lot more aggressive to start. I think that's going to be the smart thing for him to do is be aggressive. And if he's aggressive from the start, I think he's going to have a pretty good chance uh, to win some rounds, maybe kind of break the confidence and break the rhythm of, of uh, Deontay Wilder. I still look for Wilder to win, but it's going to go a full 12 rounds. I think we've shown Stavern is sturdy enough to where Wilder's not going to be able to get him out with a one-hitter quitter like he has some of the guys here recently. You know, both gentlemen have to be prepared to go full 12. There's no way this goes. This doesn't go that high. I just see both these guys being too sturdy. If anybody were to get knocked down or knocked down, I see it being Deontay Wilder for him just being sloppy, uh, maybe a little bit early on in the fight. See, I like Wilder here by knockout. I like him probably about the sixth, seventh round. Let's say KO six. Because as, as inactive as Wilder has, has been, Stavern really hasn't been active. I think he's had one fight in three years. I think it was Derek Rossi. He got dropped by Rossi. Now, Rossi's not terrible. But, you know, I, at, at Stavern's age and with his activity, I just don't think he has the ability to turn it on. He just hasn't had the fight experience recently. Um, you know, I, I, I think he'll probably make a go of it the first couple rounds. But eventually, uh, I don't think he has the reserves and – I don't think he's going to be in the fight once he gets hit a lot. I think he's going to try. I think eventually a right hand's going to put him down. And he's going to stay down. I, I'm looking this. I'm, I'm looking for the knockout here by Wilder. I don't know if he's going to look fantastic, but I think it may resemble the last few Wilder fights where he gets the knockout and doesn't win many fans. So uh, that's what I'm looking to see. I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope it's a good fight. Uh, I hope for Wilder's sake, uh, if he were to win, that they keep him active and find people that can fight. You know, the, the challenging thing is you have – Joshua, who's a superstar over there. I know we'll talk about that fight in a little bit. You have Parker, who's in New Zealand uh, and with top rank. And then you have Wilder. So these people are almost at like three different poles, and they don't necessarily all work together. Sometimes they do. But uh, let's hope that he can get something bigger in 2018. Um, one other fight I wanted to talk about on this card, uh, because it's a, it's a fun style uh, clash, uh, which is Sean Porter against Adrian Granados. Um, I think both – of their last fights show what they're made of. Uh, Porter knocked out uh, Andre Berto in a very entertaining fight, a very rough style. Uh, Porter just mauled Berto away and also wound up landing some big right hands, uh, vicious left hooks to the body. He fights in that frenetic, you know, pressure style. Um, and Granados uh, fought very well against Adrian Broner. Uh, lost a, a close decision. I believe it was a, uh, a, a majority decision loss. And uh, looked very good. You know, Granados has had a handful of losses in his career, and all of them have been split decisions or majority decision losses. He's in every fight. He's kind of an action fighter. Most of his fights are at 140. He's had a few at 147. I like the style matchup. Uh, how, do you, how do you view the fight? You know, it's one of those things to where, you know, Sean Porter's such a rough guy to deal with. And we've seen from Granados that he's, you know, he's no punk either. Uh, but, you know, Porter style is just one of those. He just makes it so difficult for everyone who encounters him. And I don't think Granados is going to be any different. I think he's going to fall victim to that as well. Uh, I, I do look for Granados, though, to, you know, give Porter a competitive fight. But I just think Porter style is just one of those where some nights it is horrifically bad to watch on television. Other nights, it's just like, wow, this guy's just grinding away at his opponent. I yeah. enjoy watching this. And kind of like he did with, uh, with Keith Thurman. So I, I think it's going to be one of those kind of fights to where Porter's a professional. 
Porter likes to get things done, look for him to grind it out, and then actually look fairly decent in this and not have one of those awful aesthetically fights that he typically has. Uh, and for Granados, it's going to be another one of those nights where, the you know, this tough luck kid, uh, again, you know, will come up, you know, short of the stick. As hard as he trains and hard as he grinds, he just never seems to get – uh, the opportunity or, or get a, a clean shake, as he says. But I think this is going to be one of those times where Porter is going to be the clear winner of the unanimous decision just with his grind out style. Yeah, I see that as well. I mean, we've seen the two fighters who've beaten Porter are Keith Thurman and Kel Brook. And what do they have in common? They're both tall. They both are active. They both can use their feet and their body. And they also are well-schooled and and taught and in both of those fights we're still very competitive i just don't think Gran- uh, granados has the clean enough work you know to to win those rounds definitively i don't think he has that style where he can land and get out uh you know he likes to come forward like porter does um you know i'm not gonna say it's a mirror image of each other because i think porter has some more skills and dimensions uh, i agree with you i i think i think porter wins a, a fairly clear unanimous decision I think it should be a fun action fight as long as they don't clash heads in the first three rounds and the fight is called off, which is possible. Um, but I like it. I, 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 you know, for whatever reason, Porter is not the favorite in the PBC house. You know, there's Earl Spence out there and Peterson and blah, 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 and Danny Garcia and all these possible fights that Sean Porter uh, could be getting. Uh, and then instead he's getting Granados and Granados is no slouch. I would put him as a very capable fighter, but let's face it. You know, I think Sean Porter, you know, is at that like a, a minus level at 147. You know, he beats some champs some days, some days they beat him. Uh, and, and it's a shame that, you know, he isn't being given the type of opponents on a consistent basis that I think he deserves. Yeah, it really is a shame, you know, for him though, you know, he, he's maintained the professionalism throughout and just, Continue to plug away and just fight the opponents he's going to fight. You know, he's supposed to be a part of that fight card in August against Thomas Lorme. You know, pulling out of that. Um, I don't know if Granados is an upgrade or a downgrade really from Delorme, but you know, I'm glad he's getting another fight before the year is out, uh, since he's only had one other fight here so far this year. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to like about Porter. I mean, there are nights where Porter's style comes together better than others. But the guy is a professional every time he shows up. He wants to fight. He wants to do the things that fans want of him. You know, he wants to stay active and look good. And, you know, he gives it his all every time. And, and uh, you know, obviously he, he's not going to be reti- uh, retiring as an undefeated fighter. He's not going to go down as an all-time great. But he's going to be a damn good fighter in this era. And those people that are able to beat him are going to say, I beat Sean Porter and Sean Porter is also going to take a few scalps before his career is over as well. So I wish him the best. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the Dominic Brazil fight on that card. I've heard a few different names that have been floating around. Uh, I've heard Dylan White, uh, the heavyweight from England, is someone that's been mentioned. Uh, there are a couple of other American uh, heavyweight uh, uh, fighters, uh, fighters that might be um, brought up as well. Um, we, we will see. Uh, I like Brazil. He's a fun action fighter. He had that fantastic fight earlier this year that had four knockdowns, just this like crazy, absurd fight. And, uh, you know, he gives it his all. He's, he's clearly not skilled enough to beat the Anthony Joshua's of the world. Anthony Joshua knocked him out. But, you know, Brazil showed against Amir Mansour that if you put him in that right level of fight, he's a lot of fun. You know, he, he, he packs a punch. He gets hit a lot. I mean, he's a fun television fighter, so I hope he stays in the card, and I hope they give him a viable opponent on TV. You know, he coming out of the Olympics, I kind of expected more. I'm like, okay, this guy is not heavyweight material, and that's okay, but he's a fun TV fighter, and each era needs that as well. Very true, and, it, and it's you know kind of a great transition to another heavyweight fight. Uh, this actually happened a couple weeks before, but it's going to be a showcase belt, I think, uh, for Anthony Joshua, as we mentioned here earlier in the show, uh, he is, you know, pretty much every way ranks him number one amongst the heavyweights. He's going to be uh, against uh, Puev uh, here on October the 28th. Now, I say this is a showcase bout for Joshua because, well, I just think Joshua's a couple levels higher than Puev is at this juncture of his career. Uh, you know, with this being that kind of a fight, what do we need to see out of Anthony Joshua, you know, coming off of that mega win over Klitschko earlier this year and one of the 
one of the better fights we've had in a couple of years, especially one of the better fights in heavyweight we've had in a long time. What do we need to see out of him in this, I don't want to say rebound fight, but this is now, you've reached the apex. What, can, what, are, what is he going to do as an encore here in this fight against Pulev? Yeah, Pulev is, a, I'd say, a top 10, top 15 heavyweight from Bulgaria. Um, he has uh, a big following there. Um, he's shown skills at a certain level. You know, he has enough boxing skill to, to beat the top 15 to top 20 guys. He beats those guys, you know, convincingly. Uh, he, he punch, he's a decent punch, but not an incredible punch. He has some boxing skills, but he's not too great. Um, he had that fight with Vladimir Klitschko a few years ago, where Klitschko, I think, knocked him out in the fifth round uh, with a nasty left hook. But that was actually a, a decent fight before that. Um, I think this fight, uh, Joshua is going to be compared to Klitschko. Can Joshua get Pulev out earlier? Um, I think so. That's a natural measuring stick. And I think people are going to be looking for Joshua's defense. Um, Klitschko was able to get through with that you know, jab-right-hand combination that knocked Joshua down. Um, is that going to be a continuing problem? Has he worked with Robert McCracken to tighten up the defense a little bit? I mean, I think that's what we need to, to, to know. You know, Klitschko lands his right hand on almost everybody. It's no great tragedy to get knocked down by Klitschko. Practically everybody has. It doesn't mean anything necessarily. But, you know, is Joshua still getting tagged with Pulev's right hands? I think, I think that's what we're looking for as fans is, is he making progress? Is he tightening up the defense? I mean, I think offensively, as you mentioned, you know, Joshua has all the tools. It's really about the other side of boxing, you know, anticipating punches, getting out of the way. And Pulev does not have great hand speed. So if you're going to be getting hit with him, uh, you're not seeing punches very well. Your defensive reflexes aren't where they need to be. So I'm looking to see his defense. I'm looking to see that he has a clean fight, that he doesn't take unnecessary punches. You know, agree. It's going to be one of those things to see, you know, how he deals with, you know, the letdown of not having the Klitschko rematch, which was something I thought for many months he thought he was going to get. Then Klitschko certainly retired. It's going to be with him dealing with, you know, now you're the star, and now you're going to be kind of carrying your opponent. How he how he deals with that as well will be extremely interesting uh, to see how he reacts. Uh, I don't see Puev being much of any sort of competition for him. Uh, I look for Joshua to get him out of there within probably five to seven rounds, truth be told. Uh, but, you know, it's going to be, like you said, the small things. This is going to be a fight for him to work on the small things, the small details uh, of his fight game to see if, it, if it's improved, if he's tightened it up. But when he does face a Parker or a Deontay Wilder in 2018, then he's going to be ready for those uh, other top heavyweight champions. Agreed. So, I mean, I'll be watching, um, you know, it's fun when they're, they're good heavyweights. You know, it's fun when you have heavyweights that deliver action. I think Joshua Klitschko was such a shot in the arm, not just for hardcore boxing fans, but other boxing fans, um, because they like heavyweight boxing. It, when it's done at a high level, there's nothing else like it. You know, to see these 240 pound guys, you know, throwing punches with the force that they do and, they land and people knock get knocked down and they have to come back and recover. I mean, that Joshua Klitschko fight was thrilling stuff. And one of my favorite statistics about that fight is, if you remember, both uh, HBO and Showtime made a deal where they broadcasted that fight. So Showtime had the live rights, you know, at about 5.30 or 6 o'clock. And then later on at night, HBO showed the broadcast at 10 o'clock. I think word of mouth and buzz traveled because HBO wound up having better ratings for that fight than Showtime. So I think people found out that there was this great fight, this incredible knockout, this back-and-forth seesaw, and so word traveled, and by 10 o'clock, the, the, the replay outdrew the live fight, which is incredible. But it shows you, you know, even when Klitschko was fighting live on HBO in the afternoons, he was doing good ratings. There is this market for heavyweight boxing. It's just we need the fight, so hopefully – with Joshua and what we have with Wilder coming up. And, you know, Parker didn't look good in his last fight a couple weeks ago, but he is a, uh, you know, a guy that could bring out the best in these fighters. Uh, hopefully we are entering an era where we're going to see some exciting fights, some knockdowns, some memorable experiences. I think that's, you know, those types of fights are going to be putting boxing in a much better trajectory. 
Uh, agree, and I think that's, you know, as the heavyweights go, so does boxing um, anymore. So, I mean, that's something we definitely both agree on uh, for that. Now, uh, another card we want to talk about, and one of our guests is going to be joining us here in a little bit to talk about his fight here in about 20 minutes. Austin Trout will join us. Is a big triple header that uh, PBC is putting on on Showtime, was featuring three title fights of 154 pounds here on, on uh, October 14th. Uh, we have Laura versus Gachet. We have uh, Charlo versus Lubin. Austin Trotto challenged Jared Hurd. You know, three titles on the line, three separate bouts at 154. Uh, you know, shout out to, to, to PBC and Showtime for stacking this card from the get-go. I first want to give them credit for that. And then for all six of these guys to agree to actually fight legitimate tough competition, I also love that about this card. Yeah, I do too. Um is it strange before we get in each of the fights that Laura Gachet is the headliner? I mean, isn't that? I mean, I I would have thought it would have been Charlo against Lubin. Lubin, yeah, yeah, and, and and you know even so, then put her Trout. I would put this as the opener. It's very odd that Laura Gachet. I, I mean, I don't know how that organization works sometimes, and I won't pretend that I do. Uh, it's just very, um, uh, it's very strange to me. Let's put it that way. Uh, let's open up this fight by or this this broadcast preview of this card talking about Lara Gachet. So um, Gachet is this Olympian who has been extremely slowly developed. Um, you know he is twenty and zero. Um, he's already thirty years old. Uh, he has not had a good slate of opponents. Uh, he has been dropped in his career. Um, at the same time, you know, Lara has a fight where he isn't always as sharp as he needs to be. He's also looked excellent at times. Um, you know, I thought his last really good opponent was Vanis Martirosian in their rematch, and I thought Martirosian may have pulled that out. I thought Lara got hit more than I had ever seen him get hit before. So I don't know what to make of Lara. He's very inactive. Uh, at the time, he gave Canelo Alvarez all Canelo could handle. A lot of people thought he won that fight. Um, a lot of people think Lara is the best fighter at 154 right now. Um, but he's also very much a question mark. I don't think – I remember Ronnie Shields yelling at him all the time in the ring about being more active and letting his hands go. But sometimes he puts it all together. I don't know what to make of him. I don't think that highly of Terrell Gachet. He does have a punch. He seems very limited to me. On paper, this screams Lara should win some kind of decision, but I know a few people that think Gaucher has an outside shot at winning. What, what's your initial take on this fight? Yeah, I think this is almost too early for Gaucher at this juncture of his career. I mean, if you really look at his resume, what in the world has he done to earn a title fight to where he's actually going to be fighting for two titles, uh, a WBA and a uh, IBO title? What has he done to this juncture of his career to deserve that? And I can't answer that, which makes me really believe uh, Laura's going to beat the brakes off of him and box his top off for 12 rounds. And it's going to get embarrassing by the seventh or eighth round to where we're going to be like, okay, enough's enough. Um, Laura's just levels above this guy, and I just don't get why, why this fight was made and why he was selected to face Laura at this point of his career. I don't think he's really done enough. Granted, he's 20-0. Doesn't have a lot of punching power. Does, like you said, seems very limited and very basic. Um, definitely not one of the guys at 154, I would say, is must-see TV. But I don't know. It's PBC. A lot of things they do make us scratch our heads at times. And I, I think that theme of the guy not being ready for this opponent is also potentially in play for the Lubin fight. We can get to that in a minute. Um I'll say this about Laura. Uh, he better win this fight convincingly. Um, I just, I don't feel like Laura is one of these favorite guys either from PBC. And, and for that, I understand why. I don't know why Porter wasn't. But for Laura, he's not a pleasing style. I think he's difficult to deal with sometimes. Um, you know, nobody really goes away like, I can't wait to watch Erislandy Laura fight. So if he were to lose, especially to somebody in the PBC world, I don't think they'd be shedding tears. Let's put it that way. I don't think Gaucher is that type of opponent. I think Lara should be able to win that fight. 
but I'm just saying he, he better not make that fight close. That that's the only thing. I, I like I like Lara by decision here. Uh, Lara doesn't step on the gas enough to get too many knockouts. He's a cautious fighter. Uh, I think he wins some type of nine three ten two type fight. But if it is closer, uh, you know we've seen all sorts of fun scoring this year, and it would not surprise me if the fight does get somehow competitive that Lara may be not liking the result. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that in regards to Lara because my favorite Lara fight, oddly enough, is when he fought uh, Alfredo Angulo. And in that yep. fight, we sh- he, he, we showed that he can take a punch and can get knocked down, but he also throws some punches. So, uh, you know, it, it's also one of those things, to, it seems to me at times, that he doesn't take it too seriously there inside the ring to where he can be a little bit lethargic. And like you said, Ronnie Shields had to yell at him uh, in courses and fights to where, you know, he just knows that his boxing style is so superior that he's going to take a few chances or let some opponents get some shots off. You know, I don't want this to be this fight for him to do that. This isn't the kind of time to do that. Take care of business, get this guy out of there, and then, you know, possibly see what's down the road for you. But um, I'm like you. If he were to lose this fight or look bad, he's done. It's He's going to get ran through and just completely ranked on uh, in boxing circles and social media because – you know, for him being this great boxer, if he does not make this look easy against the one-dimensional guy, it, it, could, it could get rough here for him in 2018 when he makes his next return to the rank. Yeah. I think it's a very important fight because he has to look good, again, especially in comparison to the other fights that are going to be on the card. You know, if, if let's say, Lubin or Charlo have great performances in that fight or, or even Hurd or Trout, you know, those guys are going to cement their status in the division. You know, those two fights are going to do that. They're, they're more competitive fights on paper. And, you know, it, who, who are we going to talk about at the end of that night? You know, at the end of October 14th, which 154-pound fighter are we giving the buzz to? Like, oh, my God, I can't wait until he, he gets back in the ring. I can't wait till these two fight. You know, I, I think this competition is really good. Um, you know, similar to that Superfly card uh, in September. You know, we're going to showcase this division. And we have six guys, and five I think are good, and, and, and Gachet. And we're going to see, you know, who's rising to the top, who's going to create fan demand, who's going to create excitement for the networks, which one of these guys is going to be a headliner moving forward. I think there's a lot on the line for these guys. And, and I do praise the matchmaking here to the sense of I'm glad it's all in one card. I'm glad Showtime's broadcasting it. I'm glad we're seeing this all in one night instead of uh, spread out over three different dates. Uh, I'm very uh, enthusiastic about this card. And I think Lara, I think especially if he is a headliner, he's going to see those performances earlier before he gets in the ring. And I think hopefully that will motivate him. That's what I'm hoping. I mean, I thought Lara looked his best against a guy like Austin Trout. And for whatever reason, you know, he just put it all together that night and had a very strong performance. And that showed you the level he can fight at. But he is not always at that level. And I'm wondering, you know, maybe he doesn't beat, maybe he doesn't lose to Gachet. But if he gets hit like, like Vanis did, uh, um, you know, that, that's, you know, a lot of people are going to look at him like, you know what, this guy isn't so tough anymore. I can hit him. I can get through to him. And that, and that era of, not that he was invincible, but that he was always that guy that nobody really wanted to fight. Well, if he doesn't have that stigma anymore, well, he will get those fights. But you know what, he might also lose them. Very poignant, yeah, because, you know, this is the guy that said that Floyd Mayweather was ducking him. So, uh, right. Right. I mean, it, it, it's, it's going to be a Right, he was calling out Golovkin, know. he was calling out everybody, yeah, yeah. He crashed the Canelo press conference, that's how he got the Canelo fight. So, you know, credit to him for having balls, because it takes balls to do something like that. Uh, and, and to his credit, even the Canelo fight, you know, he did – you can make an argument about him winning that fight. And, uh, sure. you know, he, he backed up what he said he was going to do in the press conference. You know, he crashed it. He, he called out a guy and got the fight. You know, for something like this, uh, you know, this like this is you know, it's a great way of putting this. And we'll definitely ask this to Austin. You know, this is somewhat of an eliminator card, if you will, will here for uh, 154 here on the 14th of October, that we could be seeing these guys facing each other. So this is almost in a weird way a de facto tournament. So the better you look, the better chance you have to headlining in the next card on Showtime. So a lot of pressure on Lara being the headliner here on this card. 
and being maybe the guy, the front runner, uh, to stay and keep that number one position at 154 after his fight here with Ter- Terrell Gachet. Um, now, the other fight, Terrell McCarthy, that, that we kind of think is interesting is Lubin versus Charlo. Um, you know, we, we may be saying the same thing like we said against, with Gachet. Is Lubin getting his fight too soon? Is Charlo starting to put it together? You're seeing what his brother did, now his brother's out of division. This, this fight is – this is more of a pick em fight for me, I think. I think this is more of a 50-50 fight than what some would lead you to believe. Oh, I, I think a lot of people are picking Lubin. And, uh, you know, Lubin is one of these uh, fantastic-looking prospects that has a big punch. Um, you know, Lubin has faced nobody to get a title shot. I'm, I'm serious. Like I was at last week against uh, Jorge Coda. Um you know, Coda had nothing in that fight. Um, I, I don't think Lubin's opposition has been good at all. I don't think they've developed in the right way. I think it's too soon for him. I think he needs at least two more fights. I don't understand the rush. He's 22. Um, I, I don't understand it. And it's not like Charlo is necessarily a weak opponent. So with that being said, and I said that about Earl Spence too, that he was being rushed a little bit, or he didn't have the right developmental fights. But if you look at Sp- uh, um at least Spence fought Chris Algieri. Uh, at least Spence fought um, the, the South African guy that was a fairly decent fighter, a top 15 guy. You know, you can't find anybody in the top 15 that Lubin's fought. He, you just haven't had that level of competition. But with that said, you saw what Spence did when he went over to England and fought Brook and knocked him out. The great ones have that ability to take that jump and that leap despite Whatever happens with matchmaking, despite not being active enough, they have that ability. So I think people are thinking that Lubin might be one of those special talents, that he has the ability, despite not being developed enough, despite not based on archives, that he's just so good that he could beat Charlo. And it's a very fascinating matchup. I don't think it's necessary. I'm not hating it. I just like to see kids developed as well as possible. I don't, I don't like rushing kids until they're ready. Um, going to the Charlo side of the equation, uh, Charlo uh, left Ronnie Shields to also train Spence. And Charlo um, had two impressive knockouts in his last two fights. Uh, Charles Hatley, uh, who didn't really offer too much, but Charlo was as aggressive as we've ever seen him and really put his punches together well. And then the fight before that was John Jackson, which was a very interesting fight in that Charlo is supposed to be a really good boxer. And John Jackson was boxing the crap out of him for about six rounds. And then all of a sudden Jackson gassed and got hit somewhere and, and Jackson fell apart and Charlo wound up knocking him out almost uh, with, with a free shot when Jackson wasn't protecting himself well. So, it's tough to make from that performance. I looked at it as a transitional fight between Ronnie Shields and Derek James. So looking at his fight against Hatley and Hatley was nothing special. You know, did Charlo turn a corner going with Derek James? He looks like he's sitting down on his punches more. It looks like he's committing to his power more. He believes in it. Or is that fool's gold because Hatley was nothing and John Jackson essentially fell apart more so than Charlo did anything. How, how do you view where Charlo is going into this fight right now? You know, the, the Charlo brothers are, as a whole have always been one. I've been, I've never been able to put my finger on exactly what they are and what they can be. <laughs> and you, I, I mean, it's the truth. I mean, I, honest to God, I had the time to get them confused. So I'm having to, I'm literally looking at box work to make sure I got the right Charlo up, to make sure I'm looking at the right resume. Uh, but, you know, Jamel here, you know, is the one that's going to be fighting here on the 14th of October. Um, you know, like you said, he was the, the one who was the more boxing of the two brothers. Um, we've now seen his brother move up to, heavy, up to middleweight and has the punchy power, but you still don't really know with either Charlo what they're going to become, and I think the Lubin fight is going to be, as weird as this may sound, is actually a good testing point for him, because Hatley was... He was washed, um, you know, no disrespect to him, but he just didn't have much that night. Jackson was winning the fight, like you said, until he pretty much gassed out. And really some of his other fights prior to that weren't great. I mean, Brian Monterosen, um wasn't a great fight for him either. Um, so, I mean, these, these opponents really don't bring much to the table. We know what Lubin can do. 
Uh, he's still young and growing, but right now he's somewhat of one-dimensional a uh, fighter, but he's really good at that one dimension he does do. So what kind of problems is that going to pose for Charlo when Charlo goes in there? Because Charlo's going to know what he's facing, what's going to be coming forward to him. It's going to be important to see if he can just maintain that and just, just fight his fight and not get into something else and, and try to get into a slug match with a guy who does have punching power. Um, I, I just don't know with the Charlos. They're just so confusing to me as a whole. I don't know what to do with them. I really don't. Yeah, and I think we'll talk about that when Trout comes on because I thought Austin Trout had a very good back half of the fight against uh, Jermall Charlo. And, you know, I thought that was going to be a problem for him against Julian Williams. And then Charlo comes in and knocks out Julian Williams and looks fantastic. So I hear what you're saying. It's tough to get put your finger on what they offer. I know that um, Jermel at 154 has a very good jab. He could use the ring very well. Um, you know, he has, I mean, he has a lot of talent. He has skills. I mean, one of the things that I was excited about is that he was finally believing in his punches. And so that's, you know, that's a big difference to me um, because he used to kind of box and, he would kind of run and not run, but like use his legs a lot. That's, uh, you know, I just didn't buy, um, I didn't think he was fighting in the best style for him. And I think he's feeling a little more confident now. Um, I'll take issue with you on one sense about Lubin. I don't know if Lubin's necessarily one dimensional, you know, he has a lot of power, but I think he has great hand speed too. He has boxing skills. Um, I don't know if he's one dimensional. I don't know what he is on the A level or the A minus level. But from what I've seen, like he does possess a, a, a number of talents in the ring. Um, but we just don't know. Um, I think the trendy hipster pick for this fight, by the way, is to go with Lubin, but I've never been a trendy or hipster guy. And I'm actually going to go with experience here in this fight. And I'm going to go with Charlo by winning a uh, unanimous, competitive decision, something about eight, four, seven, five, something like that, where I think Lubin will not be disgraced by this fight. I think he'll be, um, I think it'll be one of those things where Charlie will probably get out to an early lead, being more comfortable in the situation, using his jab, relying on his fundamentals. I think Lubin will have some success as the fight wears on, but probably start a little too late. And I think this experience will be, good for him. So I think, I think Charlo winds up getting a unanimous decision in a competitive fight. Uh, I'm not staking out my, uh, any deeds to my house or real estate I might own on that. I'm not a hundred. If, if Lubin may wind up winning by knockout or so be it, as I said, the great ones can make that leap. We don't know if Lubin's great. I'm not one of these big prospect people that think, Oh, he's a prospect. He must be fantastic. Uh, I'm going to go with Charlo here um, with a small degree of confidence, not no confidence, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if the other happens. Yeah, with this being such a pick'em fight, I'm going to go Charlo, but I have zero confidence in this uh, pick. Uh, I don't think we're really going to have a true idea how this fight's going to play out. So probably like the fourth round, after these two guys kind of fill each other out and see what's what. Um, but I'll go Charlo just because I I honestly don't know. It, it, it seems. Like I said, he's a hard one to p figure out what he exactly is. Lubin's still very young and, and growing in his career. So I'm going to go Charlo just off of the, the body of work. But I think it's going to be a pick and fight. and will be a, a truly interesting fight here to watch here on the 14th. Yeah, I like it. I think it's uh, it's a great fight. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. And that's, uh, and that's part of the fun. Um, you know, this is definitely one of those... Uh, you know, can Lubin uh, capture the imagination of the boxing fans? Uh, or is this a case of, well, you know what? Why did they just give him the two fights that he should have had beforehand? You know, like, why did they give him an unnecessary loss? Uh, so I think there will be some questions to ask after this fight or maybe some questions answered. Um, so this is a good matchup. Uh, I'm not a matchmaker. Uh, I would not have made this fight. But as a fan, it is intriguing, and I'm into it. 
Yeah, I, I, I do like the fact that, you know, the young guys, you know, willing to, to be in there and challenge for a title this young in his career because he could have been soft and said, nah, I'm not ready or no, I don't want it. You know, he's taking the opportunity that's being presented in front of him and he's taking advantage of it. So uh, if it pans out and it plays to his advantage, you know, kudos for it to him. Even if he were to lose, you know, we, we've seen this with a lot of fighters and I think this generation of fighters ha- kind of has this problem. Even at a loss, a lot can be gained and a lot can be learned about yourself as a fighter. And even sure. if he were to lose his fight, uh, I think Lubin can still grow and still potentially be a fantastic fighter because, again, he is just so young and there's so much that he can still grasp and, and pick up on. So even if he were to come up short here, you know, it would be important for him to keep his chin up and not get down on himself being so young and losing his first title shot. Uh He's got more to come as long as he stays in the straight and narrow. So we'll see. But like I said, I'm going Charlo just because of the resume and the body of work. So we'll see. Now, uh, we'll be joined here in a few moments here by another fighter who will be a part of this October 14th card on Showtime. That is no doubt Austin Trout. He'll be taking on Jared Hurd. Uh, you know, for Hurd, it's going to be his first title defense, uh, which is something else. Um you know, what, what What are your impressions of Jared Hurd, you know, after his win and, and winning the title here early this year? You know, he fought um, Tony Harrison earlier this year, and I thought um, I, I had a tough time initially picking that fight because I thought Harrison was a better boxer. But I had seen how Harrison lost earlier in his career to Willie Nelson, and, uh, and basically that was the same exact fight. Uh, Tony Harrison, in my opinion, dominated Jared Hurd. Uh, for the first uh, six or seven uh, fights, uh, six or seven rounds of that fight. And then Tony Harrison gassed, and Jared Hurd, uh, you know, landed some big shots and, and got his knockout. Um, it, it's was, it was funny. It was, it was almost like Tony Harrison. Like, seriously, like, I had Tony Harrison winning, like, seven rounds to nothing. Not too dissimilar from the John Jackson fight against uh, Jermel Charlo. Uh, and then something happened, like somebody whispered in Tony's ear, hey, Tony, you, you did good work. It's time for you to lose. Um, I'm not saying that happened because I, I, think, I think Tony Harrison's like an up and up, you know, a straight shooter. But it looked like that. It was just so strange. And so that fight exposed a lot of issues with Jared Hurd, that he's very tall and he uses his size well. But when he's terms about putting forth his – putting his boxing skills together, he's a very unfinished – product uh he had no answer for tony harrison's movement uh the way that 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 and and if you're austin trout you look at that fight you're like wow i i gotta box this guy can move i can box and move you know or i have that ability to do that um but heard also uses his body very well um uh leans on fighters uh does pack a big punch especially his right hand to the body i think is a good shot um, uh, his straight right hand could be good. I don't like his left hook. I don't think he turns it over well. Um, I, I like this fight uh, because it's a real opponent for Jared Hurd, meaning if, if he, Austin Trout is going to make Jared Hurd fight. He's going to make Jared Hurd have to think his way through this fight and beat him. So that is, so if, if Hurd is able to get the victory, he will have learned a lot in this fight. He will be tested in this fight. He will have to think his way through this. Austin Trout is not suddenly going to look at his watch, get a beep, and say, oh, it's time to go down. Uh, he is going to go the full 12 rounds. And so uh, I think that's a, that's a great experience. And if you're Trout, um, there's certainly some things you like about this matchup. You have to be concerned about Hurd's uh, activity uh, rate. Uh, you have to be concerned about her size and his physicality. Uh, Trout has been dropped before. Um, you have to you have to be defensively clean. You have to be clean in this fight. You can't make mistakes. Um, uh, so there are risks and opportunities for both fighters here. And uh, I really like this matchup. It's very intriguing. Now, you know, oddly enough, you brought up Tony Harrison. I uh, just want to point out he's also going to be in the card on the undercard of this uh card here on October 14th. He's actually moved up to middleweight. So I don't know what, you know, prompted that. Maybe that loss, he just said, screw it, I want no more 154. And he's moving up to middleweight. So, uh, or it could just be a between, 
it could just be like a between weights kind of fight. You know, there was, he just wanted to fight and, you know, they offered him, Hey, do you want to fight? And he said, sure. And, and it, maybe he, I, I don't, I didn't hear where he was officially moving up to 160, but you know, sometimes fighters will fight above their weight limit, you know, as they're waiting for bigger things. So it could be that. True. True. Indeed. Uh, we are still waiting to uh, have uh, Austin Trout join us. Uh, hopefully everything he hopefully does join us. <laughs> um, as scheduled uh, here in a few moments. Uh, so, you know, uh, let's see. Where, I'm thinking where I want to go with this here. Uh, hmm. I don't know. It's just it's crazy to think that we have a lot of these young guys like Jared Hurd. Uh, you know, this is only going to be his second fight of 2017. Um, you know, for his opponent, Austin Trout, Trout hasn't fought in almost 18 months. Uh, yeah. kind of, you know, Erickson Lubin, Lubin's only had, I think this is going to be only his second fight. Uh, yeah, he's actually, 22. Yeah, this is only going to be his second fight of, of this yeah, year. Yeah, he's so, 22. It, it just hurts my heart to see these young guys, and these fighters, period, just seem me like they have such large gaps in between their bouts to where, at times, it almost feels like we kind of forget, like, oh, I didn't know this guy was a title holder. It's like we have, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, sometimes twelve months in between these fights, you know. How hard is it you think for a lot of these guys, especially, you know, let's just kinda of focus in on this card, for these guys to keep this momentum going at one fifty four and be a champion and try to build upon that if we're not seeing them enough. Well the good thing is that this card will get all of them up. You know, they are going to be trying to make a statement amongst the other fighters and to the Showtime network. So I think this is the type of card that will motivate all of them. Uh, so I, I don't think that in particular will be a problem. But you, you saw Austin Trout's comments, and, and if he is able to get on, uh, we'll ask him about it. I mean, he wasn't happy he was out of the ring for so long. And you're talking about some other fighters. I mean, look at Errol Spence. I mean, it just kills me. The guy goes over to England. You know, he has an amazing performance. Why hasn't he been back already? He should have been fighting September or in this month, building off that momentum, you know, creating more of a star attraction, and he's out waiting. Now, he, he may be fighting in December. He might be fighting Lamont Peterson or, or Janu in January. That's a good fight, but it's like I don't understand the six or seven months. I do understand it, actually. Let me back up. I do understand it. The reason why I understand it is – with the PBC, they no longer have enough dates for all of their fighters, and that's a real problem. Uh, what I don't understand is why they haven't prioritized certain fighters that this is my guy. I want Wilder fighting three times a year. I want Spence three times a year. These other guys can go fuck themselves. No, I mean, don't say them that, but I mean, that's, 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 what, that's what they need. I mean, I don't understand it. Like, there's no triage process. Like, why is Arizlani Lara highlighting, uh, headlining a card? You got 50 people that are more interesting to the boxing public than Lara. So it's like, I don't understand the thought process here. So they no longer enough dates because they ruin their, you know, they no longer have the Spike deal. They no longer have the ESPN deal. All they're left with is what they had with Showtime. And then they got a couple of spots with Fox. And then they got... Um, um, you know, the PBC on FS1. They FS1, just don't yeah. have the number of dates for their fighters. So you're seeing two twice a year now. Maybe their young guys fight more. That's what we're left with. And, and it's, it's tragic because, you know, it shortchanges these boxers, not just in opportunities, but as a way to get better, as a way to becoming a star. Um, it's, it's disappointing. And um, uh, we, we want... You know, it's like we don't want – like I don't want to be on this show being negative. Like I'd rather say like I'm so excited for Earl Spence's next fight. I can't wait till he's back in the ring. Oh, he's fighting next month, and then he's going to fight. Like like we want to be invested in these guys emotionally. We want them to cross over and become big players. And it's just some of these basic truths about marketing and, you know, aren't being followed, and it does get very frustrating sometimes. It does, and, and it also gets frustrating when uh, we have guests and we don't hear from them. But you know what? We move on. That's okay. Uh, let's so talk about. Um, let's talk yeah. about. There's some other fights on that day uh, previous to the 154 pound card, I believe. Uh, isn't there? Isn't that the uh, Leo Santa Cruz uh, fight, or is, he, is that before Wilder? You have to remind me on. I'm getting my dates confused real fast. I know Leo Santa Cruz 
and uh, Abner Morris are fighting in separate uh, fights uh, on Fox prior to one of those Showtime cards. I just need to make sure uh, my days are correct. But um, I am actually uh, pulling that up now. It is on the 14th of October. Yes. So that's, so yes. Yeah, that's the, that's the same. So that's going to be on Fox. Uh, Leo Santa Cruz is uh, Avalos, and uh, Abner Morris uh, is also on that card, and he's going to be fighting Andres Gutierrez. Uh, as you know, Santa Cruz and Morris had a very competitive fight a few years ago, a very entertaining one. Santa Cruz won. Uh, Morris, for whatever reason, thought he deserved a rematch. A few thought so. Um, but because of their sanctioning body, they decided a rematch needed to happen. Uh, but instead of that rematch happening, Santa Cruz wanted this in-between fight beforehand against Chris Avalos. Chris Avalos was a beef fighter on his best day, and he no longer is at that level. And so, in my opinion, this went uh, a little better about the Abner Morris uh, Gutierrez fight. Uh, Gutierrez was supposed to fight Carl Frampton earlier this year until Gutierrez lost a fight with his shepherd and then wound up cracking two or three teeth. And so ah. now so now Gutierrez is back in the ring. Gutierrez is 35-1-1. One, and one, uh, is from Mexico. Um, has had one loss to Christian Maharis, an older Christian Maharis. Uh, but Maharis, you know, has... You know, was not without any skill. I mean, Maharis in his day was a fantastic fighter, but uh, you, you shouldn't be losing Christian Maharis at 130 pounds um, if you're a very good fighter. So he has a bunch of wins uh, against a lot of people that uh, you and I both know very well about. Uh, uh, people have seen him in the ring. You know, he's not without talent. I think Maharis is expected to get the win here. Um, I don't really like these marking time cards because that's what they are. It's like, I just don't understand it. It's like that Fox card earlier in the year uh, that had Figueroa against Robert Guerrero. It's like you have a show on Fox on prime time between seven o'clock and nine o'clock on the East. How many opportunities to get for this? And you're showing two fights that you, yeah, you're showing two fights that you don't think will be of, competitive. I mean, it's sin, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, you have all these other fighters in the stable that can be decent and you're left with this. It's really, it's really a shame. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more bizarre than a shame than anything. It's probably the best way of putting it. It's extremely bizarro because, well, it is PBC. Now, granted, I will say this card is promoted by Ringstar. This ran by Richard Schaefer, so whatever that's worth. But uh, right. it is very strange that we're getting these two guys not fighting each other, fighting guys that most casuals are going to have no clue who they are on Fox in prime time when Fox can be showing college football. And it's very odd. It's very. It seems very unnecessary. It seems counterproductive. Uh, that's probably the best way to describe it. It's counterproductive because if you have a mega card on Showtime, and this is a hell of a card on Showtime, it is. there is no point – that it should be going head to head with another promotion on Fox when everybody's being paid out the same pockets. You know, no, it'd I, be completely well, different if it was on HBO. But this makes no well, sense with all these guys. Well, being this is leading. This is leading. This is leading up to it, so they're not going head to head. So it's okay. the same night. So, so it's Fox. I think it's from seven to nine, and then the Showtime card starts at nine. So it's supposed to be a a quote unquote seamless transition from. If, if, I guess if you think of this 154-pound card needs its own off-television undercard, the off-television undercard is Fox. So you have these two fights on Fox, and then they transition to Showtime. But still, I, I just think it's a missed opportunity. And uh, I would have opportunities. you got a lot more casual people that are watching the networks. Why not put your best product on Fox? I don't understand it, but, you know, that's why I'm here, you know, a lowly blogger you know, having my <laughs> podcast and not making the big million dollar decisions because I don't know anything. Uh, so anyway, um, that's all I have to say about but, that card. I do want to point out two quick things, a part of that card that we won't see televised. Antonio DeMarco is still fighting. He's on the undercard against Eddie, Eddie Ramirez. Um, yeah. I guess this is pretty much going to be a showcase bout here for Ramirez. And then Ivan Ranchak 
uh, also on that card as well. Somebody that a lot of people were high on at one time, and then a lot of people now have just completely and utterly forgotten. Uh, he's had a well, rough couple yeah. of years to where people have just pretty much just said, you know what, we're good. Well, Red Cats has uh, has shown his his level, you know, where he's uh, you know he he's a B he's a B level guy. Um, I saw his last fight. Um, he looked good in spurts. Um, I, I'm not. I think there was kind of a, a shaky uh, win there or a shaky draw there. Um, he's some people thought he was a, a great prospect. It turns out he's not. He's he's a solid B fighter. He's you know gonna be one of these undercard guys. He could probably beat somebody on it on a good night. Uh, just doesn't have the uh, athletic mobility and. He doesn't have a true offensive arsenal uh, to, to trouble the best. Uh, you know, he's, he's a capable guy, uh, and that's fine. Not every fighter is going to be world level, um, but that that's where he is. So, yeah, that, that rounds out the night of action we'll have on various networks, thanks to PBC, here on October the 14th. But we're going to talk about cards here on November 11th here in a few moments with Carl Moretti, uh, VP of Boxing Operations for Top Rank. He's going to join us to talk about uh, what they've got going on there. They've got a card with Jesse Magdaleno here on November the 11th. Uh, we've got, obviously, Lomachenko, Rick and Dow that, you know, the all the masses. You, I, you know, one thing I do want to ask him is, are they shocked on how quickly those tickets have went? Because on I'm paper, I, I, I really am too, truth be told, because – these aren't two guys that, you know, light up the box office. And, we, you know, we pick and make fun of, of Rick and Dow. And we know that uh, some boxers have kind of thrown shade at Lomachenko and, and him fighting in smaller venues and what have you. But these two guys are putting up good numbers as far as ticket sales go. And the buzz is legit for this fight. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. people excited about this card. So definitely want to, you know, know, touch bases with him about that. Like, it, it's going people... over well better. I know people flying in for this card. I mean, not even, I'm not talking about like media people. I'm talking about like fight fans. They're like, really? Everything that's here, you're flying in for this card? <laughs> and they are. And, and you know what? It, it captures the imagination. I mean, we'll go into this fight a little bit. I don't want to over, over preview it before Carl gets on. But yes, I am surprised. And the other thing that's amazing to me, if you look at the boxing calendar now, there's going to be like a big fight in New York every week from like Thanksgiving until the end of December. And so usually they don't do that. They don't, you know, they're, they're worried about oversaturating the market, but you got Danny Jacobs card, which we'll talk about later. That's going to be in New York. You got the Kovalev fight. That's going to be in New York. You got this looks like Kodo is going to fight in New York. Um, I mean, you got four big cards, I think on consecutive weekends and I'm hearing Danny Garcia might fight in New York by the end of the year. And so like, Good for top rank for getting out in front, you know, not that they anticipate all these other fights, but they said, you know what, let's get this, let's put tickets on sale, we're at the garden, let's move our product, you know, we're going to sell out our fight, uh, let's not win. I think they got ahead of the game, uh, they announced that fight, I think when I was out in Nebraska, I think that was that fight was announced either in late August or early September, and they said, you know what, let's, let's get it out there, and so they did a good mm-hmm. job, I, I am amazed. I mean, I was at Lomachenko's fight in Maryland early in the year uh, when he fought Jason Sosa. And, you know, he had, I think that arena sat about 3,500 people. It was very spirited. It was a sellout there. So that's not going to say he had no fans, but it's not like he's, you know, selling out 10,000 fight arenas. Um, So I think he is developing a following, but I think people are, this fight has captured their imagination with all the Olympic gold medals uh, with all the skill, you know, uh, you know, there are those, you know, hyper skill people they love. And, and as I said, on my site, um, uh, a lot of people in America love dancing. And so dancing programs are very popular in America. And so you're going to have two phenomenal dancers. Rigondeaux is a perfect dancer. If you actually look at him, you can almost hear the cha-cha going on in your head. And then Lomachenko literally took dancing lessons as a kid. His father uh, you know, as a part of way to develop him as a boxer, made him dance. So you have two of the best dancers. So they're people that love boxing. They could take their, their girlfriends and their wives who love dancing. You really get two for the price of one. It's a special night. Well, you're, you're leaving out a key component of why this fight is actually maybe as popular as it is. 
is the social media. Like the Twitter wars that Rick and Dow's handler of his Twitter had with, you know, Lomachenko's manager and throwing out shade at top rank. It, it, it was it was all inspiring because I'd wake up in the morning like, okay, what is Rick and Dow's handler going to say on Twitter today? So, I mean, it really helped build some anticipation for the fight that might not have been there. And kudos to Rick and Dow's people because, let's face it, you know, after his fight, a part of the uh, Ward uh, Klitschko Part 2 card, you know, literally that next morning, you know, he started trolling on Twitter about getting a fight with Lomachenko. So, you know, kudos to them for whoever's running that Twitter. They did a great job with that. Yeah, and um, you know, I think that fight uh, has, has captured the imagination. It surprises me. And it surprised me in a good way because it seems usually in boxing um, we're surprised in a bad way, right? It's like these two fighters are compelling. Why are nobody there? Um, for instance, Kovalev Ward, the, the rematch, actually sold fewer tickets than the first one. Even the first one was a really good fight. You know, and you're like, what's going on with boxing? I don't understand it. Like, the first fight was good. It was controversial. Why did it sell fewer tickets? But yet it did. Uh, and that, there's so many times you're like, I don't know where the people are. But I'm glad the people are coming for this one. And, uh, uh, you know, kudos. Um, let's go back to that fight for a second. Um, one of the other... Uh, fights that while we have a little time to talk about, um, let's talk about Danny Jacobs uh, against Lewis Arias. And um, I think that's an interesting fight that's going to be uh, on HBO. That's part of his deal, a uh, three fight deal, I believe, that he signed with HBO and, and the new, his new promoter, Eddie Hearn. Uh, Eddie Hearn is, of course, uh, vice, pre- you know, in charge for Matchroom Sport over in England, the promoter of Anthony Joshua. He has an exclusive contract with sky over there. He's done a great job of building boxing on the local scene in Britain. So Eddie's trying to come over and promote a number of shows in America and making his bones here. This is a fascinating combination for many levels. Um, let's take the Jacobs angle. First, you have a guy that lost a very close decision to Golovkin early in the year. Um, now he's on the network and aligned with the right people to get him fights with people such as Golovkin, Canelo Alvarez, uh, David Lemieux, uh, uh, Andrade is, is now um, uh, uh, Andre. I'm sorry, Andrade was the Mexican fighter, but Demetrius Andre is now going to be on HBO. I mean, he's now aligned himself and, and put himself in a position to get those fights. Um, HBO had not been in the business of giving contracts to Al Heyman fighters. Jacobs is still with Heyman. Um, This is surprising on many levels. I mean, nobody saw this coming. Uh, What was your initial reaction to it? Pure shock. Um, I had no idea this was happening, no idea this was on the radar. Um, I'm still very puzzled behind it, and I know a lot of PBC fighters are well, or as well are a little bit puzzled, like how did Danny get away and how can I get away now? So I think that's kind of, you know, Danny could be yeah. a Kurt Flood of the four BBC fighters. As crazy as that I sounds, love that. But I love that analogy. That's a brilliant, brilliant analogy. Just want to tell you that. I'm, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's the truth. So, I mean, depending how things work out with him, with this deal with Eddie Hearn, we may see that with a lot more uh, PBC fighters possibly defecting or, or parting ways or Heyman just going back to the advisory role as a whole. But, you know, the, the teaming up with him and Eddie Hearn and HBO didn't see it coming – I like it, but I want to see what kind of results and what they're going to do with it down the line. You know, the first fight out, you know, is obviously going to be, you know, that's a filling out process. But it, it'll be interesting to see how they promote him and how her promotes and CP gains more American talent going into 2018, who he brings on board and who he's going to try to showcase on HBO going forward. And there's been some uh, disagreement about the quality of Jacob's opponent here. It's, it's Luis Arias, who I have seen – I believe he fought on one of the undercards this year uh, and looked very good in my opinion. I think he fought on the second Ward undercard, if, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Arias fights out of Milwaukee, um, has, you know, pretty good boxing fundamentals, can handle himself in the ring, fights with a lot of confidence. Uh, people will criticize him and say, well, he's not ready for Danny Jacobs. Um, you know, he doesn't have enough to trouble him. I mean, I look at this as, you know, Arias is taking his shot. I don't know, being aligned with, with Rocky, how many shots he's going to get. 
I look at this as kind of like when Jason Sosa, you know, took his shot a few years ago against Nicholas Walters. You know, sometimes when you're not with a favorite promoter or you aren't, uh, you know, one of the stars of the sport, you got you got to make your own luck, you know. And so for Luis Arias, I said, good for him. This is not the same situation with Charlo and Lubin because Lubin was affiliated with, you know, with the biggest manager and, you know, had all these opportunities to be developed on Showtime at a network. You know, this is Luis Arias who, let's face it, the boxing world is not waiting for Luis Arias. So you get the opportunity, you get the call, you say yes, perhaps good things happen. And, uh, you know, Jason Sosa, for instance, is going to be on that Kovalev card, you know, in November. So he's still getting HBO fight because he said yes to Nicholas Walters a few years ago. So good for him, for Luis Arias. Um, I like what I've seen from him. I do think Jacobs winds up beating him. Uh, but I don't think Luis Arias is some kind of laughable opponent. I think he's a credible guy at 160. And let's see Danny Jacobs take care of business. I'd be very excited to see Jacobs take care of business if he can. You know, and I had Luis on the show here, I don't know, about a month, month and a half ago. Oh, that's right. A little that's after, right, yeah. yeah, a little after the, the fight here uh, on the undercard, we beat uh, uh, Arof uh, Magomedov uh, on the uh, Kovalev War Part 2 undercard. And the guy does have a lot of confidence. He's a, he's a really good guy uh, at the end of the day. And you root for guys like him. And, you know, if, who knows when the opportunity is going to come across for him, like you said, you have to take advantage of these. Um, you know, he was very clear that, you know, he was, when I interviewed him at that time, he was in New York working with Rock Nation. He was going to get a fight again before the year was out. Uh, he thought it was going to be on a Ward undercard. Uh, I don't think he, in his wildest dreams, believed he'd be a part of a headlining card on yeah. HBO th- at this point here this year. But I have full confidence he's going to be ready for it. And, We've seen at times Daniel Jacobs or Danny Jacobs or whatever he wants to be called. Um, he, he's had issues, you know. Granted, he, yeah. when he lost his fight, some say it could have been because he was weak with the cancer. Whatever. I, I, I'm not going to say neither here nor there. But um, I mean, he also got he, he also got dropped. He got dropped by Sergio Mora, and Sergio Mora Mora's, is extremely yeah. light punching. You know, it's. I mean, if you get dropped by Sergio Mora, you could get dropped by anybody. But he's the Latin snake, okay? Don't disrespect him. Stop it, okay? Um, but <laughs> right, listen, you know, I, re- I respect the career that Sergio Moore made for himself, but I mean, the guy doesn't have a punch, and he, you know, he landed something on Danny. That that is correct, and I mean, and and Ars can punch. Uh, the guy's getting better. He does train with John David Jackson, Kovalev's former trainer, oddly enough. Um, so I mean, I, I think the guy. I, you can't say he's not ready. You can't say he is ready. It's almost one of those things like he's got to throw caution to the wind this fight. He's got to go balls out. And the weird thing is this. If he pulls off a victory here, especially if he knocks out Daniel, you know, just think Rock Nation, they're still in business. And yep. it could it could be a complete turn of tables uh, in the boxing realm. You know, if this being Daniel Jacobs' first fight on HBO, uh, now with this new deal, uh, if he were to choke and to lose – Oh, man, I mean, you're talking about things going sour quick. So, you know, yeah. I'm almost one of those guys. I kind of pray for that kind of thing to happen just because I like chaos. Well, you like, you like chaos. Yeah, I, I love it. It, it, brings, it brings joy to me to see chaos like that happen because, you know, when things don't go as planned, people don't know how to react. And that could be one of these situations here to where if things go left for Jacobs and he were to lose, that could blow a whole lot of things up and really screw up plans they both he, Hearn, and HBO have going into 2018. So yeah. I'm rooting for ours just because, you know, I tell people all the time, you come on the show, you get good karma, you win your fights after coming on the show. Very rarely have I had a fighter, whether it be boxing or MMA, come on the show and lose their fights. So I will say this, by coming on the show, you get good karma. So any fighters <laughs> listening to the show, you better get it set up because all I, I exuberate good karma to you for your following bouts. Yeah, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. I think, um, you know, it sets up a lot of possibilities. And, and even if Jacob, let's say Jacobs wins and uh, Andre uh, has his fight and he's expected to win too. Um, God, but I love to see that fight between the two of them. I mean, that, that you, know, at, you know, we're still going to wait probably until May for Golovkin and Alvarez to have their rematch. I would love to see Jacobs and Andre in the interim. What a fantastic mouth-watering fight. 
Uh, I, I've no idea who would pick there. I mean, that's that's one of those like those names aren't big enough for it to be a pay per view. It has to be on HBO, and that's like one of those like solid New York fights uh, because Andre is just from Rhode Island, not too far away, and Dan Jacobs is in New York. Like that's a really good fight. Well, Adam, looks like our guest is calling in, so we do have Carl Moretti, the VP of Boxing Ops for Top Rank. Uh, Top Rank's got a lot of good things going on here in 2017 and even more great things to come here in 2018. So, Carl, welcome here to Punch Space Radio. Thanks, guys. It's uh, great to be on with you tonight. Uh, hi, Carl. It's Adam. How are you? Um, you know, Brandon and I were talking about this earlier, and both of us were surprised at how well tickets have been moving for the Lomachenko Rickendow fight and pleasantly surprised, wonderfully surprised. Uh, I think reading some of the comments from Bob Aram, almost he sounded surprised, but this fight has seemed to capture the imagination of boxing fans. Did you this when the fight? No, we never, we never anticipated. We, we thought we would do well and eventually get to a sellout. We didn't think the, uh, the interest would just come out so hot and so early. And, um, you know, Bob has a tendency to over-exaggerate at times, if you didn't know that at all. Yeah, it's possible. But, possible. <laughs> but, but, but he, he's spot on with this one. There are literally less than 100 tickets left, and, and the other tickets have been bought by the fighters, the fighters' camp, the general public. Um, this isn't a secondary market thing that's out there being flooded. Right. This is a, a legit sale, and, and, you know, listen, I think it's a credit to the matchup. Obviously, New York's a great fight town. I think Lomachenko's really catching on as, a, as an attraction and a must-see fighter, and this is probably the most competitive fight you can make for him, um, you know, given what's out there. Um, one of the, the curious and, and ironic angles of this fight is that uh, Rigandau for many years was promoted by top rank. And let's just say when there was a parting of ways there, uh, there was no love lost. And a few years later, now Rigandau is back um, in a big fight with top rank as the lead promoter. Um, how, I know you're involved in negotiations. Uh, I'm not saying you need to get all inside baseball, but Rigandau certainly wanted to fight. Uh, this fight was discussed earlier in the year. Um, was this finally a difficult negotiation? Was there consternation about giving Rigandau an, another opportunity based on what happened in the past? What was kind of the thought process of identifying Rigandau as an opponent and bringing him in for this fight? Well, I think, I think what happened was there were two opponents that were being discussed at the time, one being Rigandau, obviously, and the other being Orlando Salido. And, when Orlando Salido wasn't available for the August matchup with, you know, Lomachenko, I think, you know, we all started to have some doubt as well, is this fight ever going to get made? And does he really want to fight? And as the ta the days went by and the weeks went by, and, you know, Rigandau has a good little chirper on Twitter. I, I, you know, we know it's his account, yes. but we know it's not him right. tweeting because right. uh, because the English is perfect. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. The command of the English language just isn't right. there yet. Um, you know, then, then you know, Rock Nation reached out, and, and we had obviously several conversations with them. And, um, you know, when it came down to it, um, you know, it wasn't that difficult of a negotiation. I think because Rigando is at the point now where he wants to do something meaningful. And this is a fight that Lomachenko has always wanted because of the history involved with, with the Olympics. And he really, you know, understands and, and um, respects Rigandau in the ring and what he's accomplished and looks at it as his toughest challenge as a pro. And when you heard, when we heard the, the Lomachenko camp, you know, saying, let's, we really want Rigandau, we really want the Rigandau fight, then that's what we went out and did and, and made the fight. So here we are and, and a couple of months away from it happening. Let me ask you one more question on this uh, fight before I turn to Brandon, because I know he wants to ask you a couple of things on this as well. Um, a few years ago, uh, I'm at Radio City Music Hall. Nonito Donaire is coming off of a Fighter of the Year performance. Uh, he is a small favorite on, um, over Rigandau. Donaire has become, at that point, an HBO darling and you know a big name 
and Regan Dow winds up putting in a very dominant performance, um, uh, a negative performance from a style perspective, but a very dominant performance in terms of winning the fight and making Donaire look bad. Uh, and in, in many ways, you could say, well, that kind of hurt or depreciated an asset on top rank. Are you concerned? Was Bob concerned? Todd concerned? Anybody concerned that if Rigondeau somehow, you know, makes Lomachenko look really bad, you know, was that a problem? Because he has that ability to make his opponents look bad. Um, I think there's that history there, prior history with Rigondeau is, you know, what kind of fight is he going to fight? But I, I don't know if you can make Rig, uh, if you can make Lomachenko look bad because he's such a talented right. fighter that eventually he's going to figure out a way to look good even against a bad style. Now, given Rigondeau's amateur experience and, and everything else, um, you know, I hope he doesn't run. I hope, you know, I don't expect him to run, but I don't yeah. totally expect him to walk in like, you know, Mickey Ward or something like sure, that. Either. Sure, And, yeah. you know, there's, there's two lefties in the ring, but I think you're going to see a fight that is going to, you know, the footwork from both guys is going to be amazing. And usually people don't appreciate footwork and balance and everything like that. And I think that if people go into that fight looking at the mindset that just because there aren't trading punches in the middle of the ring, that you could really have an interesting, I don't want to say chess match, but an interesting type of, you know, who's, who's boxing IQ is going to rise sure. to the top that night. And sure. Whether it's, I don't think you'll get a boring fight. I think you'll get a very intriguing fight. And at some point, one of those guys, pure bread, is going to come out, and that's where you're going to see it turn into something classic. I think. Great. Now, just a couple quick questions here in regards to that undercard. Now, granted, that's not until December. Um, you know, we know we're going to have Brian Jennings on the undercard, uh, Shakur Stevens. Uh, uh, Conlon's going to be on the card again. You know, how important is it for you guys to continue to promote and push Conlon and Shakur Stevens and uh, Stevenson? Excuse me. What do you What do you guys think that you need to see out of them uh, going forward as now as they step up in competition? Both of them, because at some juncture, those paths are going to cross and those two gentlemen are going to face off. Um, you know, we try not to highlight those two guys on the same card, but the fact that it's in New York where Conlon has such a huge following with the Irish and is gaining other fans, and Shakur is from literally across the river in Newark, that it was too good of an opportunity not to put both kids on the same card. They're still young. They're still developing. You know, I'm not looking. I'm just looking for them to just really have the New York market, you know, start to gain interest in these kids. ESPN will be behind them, you know, Will the step up in competition be a little bit more? Yeah, but, you know, we're not looking. We're still developing. And, you know, the next time they're in the ring at Madison Square Garden could be upstairs in the main arena in two to three years from now headlining a main event for a world title against each other. So it's just part of the building process that we want to do. And I wouldn't look into it as anything more than that. You know, it's still, you know, they're young in their careers. They're both still in six-round fights. And just like anything else, it's part of the building process. But when you're in Madison Square Garden, you want to take full advantage of that opportunity to have both kids, uh, you know, showcase that night. And that's what December 9th is, separate of Lomachenko Rigondeau. Uh, Carl, um, while we have you on the phone, we wanted to talk with you about another card that Top Rank is doing that both Brandon and I like a lot. It may not get the publicity uh, of some of the others, and that's the November 11th card, uh, which features uh, Jesse Magdaleno against Cesar Juarez, uh, Jose Ramirez against Mike Reed, uh, Peter Baev is fighting on that uh, that card. We both mm-hmm. like that a lot. Brandon, I know you had a couple of questions for Carl in that card. Why don't you, uh, why don't you start there? You know, as far as, you know, Jesse Magdaleno goes, he, he looks to be one of these young stars that you guys are also building up. Uh, you know, tell us about, you know, his progression over the, the years. You know, we've seen him, you know, win the title and beat uh, Donaire on the uh, Pacquiao undercard, and he's uh, had a couple other fights here since then. Uh, you know, for Magdaleno, what do you guys in top rank see in him going forward? And, you know, also on the same note, we also have better BF on this card. I, I know there's some sort of stake in that. Maybe you can kind of explain to the people uh, what you're hoping can possibly happen with uh, better BF 
and possibly doing business with top rank going forward? Well, as far as Magdaleno goes, I think, you know, what you're going to see separate of the Donaire fight is really uh, the toughest fight to date for him because we all know Cesar Juarez being in the fight of the year with Donaire. So it's a little bit of a ironic thing that now he's fighting Cesar Juarez, you know, the guy that lost to Donaire in the fight of the year, but yet we know Donaire was the guy that got beaten by Magdaleno for the title. So, um, you know, this, I think, will go a long way in, in defining where this goes from here for Jesse Magdaleno. Um, and we expect a lot. We expect a good fight. Other than that, I can't tell you other than tune in November 11th and let's see what the result is, and then we'll bet, have a better idea of where it goes from there. Um, Bitter Biev is an interesting uh, you know, fighter because of what has happened in that division. It's a one of the better divisions in boxing today um, with the retirement of Andre Ward you have all these vacant titles and the IBF took this fight which was obviously for number one to become the mandatory for Andre Ward but now it's for the vacant title so Bitter Biev obviously is a favorite we know about his amateur background he's probably one of the top three guys in boxing who can put the most pressure on an opponent you know he's fun to see uh, in that division against other matchups, he's got to win that night. As far as moving to the future, you know, we don't know what that holds for yet for anybody yet because there's obviously some legal issues. Um, the other fight on, on this card that's really intriguing to me, and, and I'm pleasantly surprised that this got made, was Jose Ramirez against Mike Reed. And uh, Jose Ramirez was a former Olympian uh, who has a very big following in Fresno. And that's the reason why this card is at Fresno or is in Fresno, because he you know, can put 10,000 fannies in the seats. And Mike Reed is mm-hmm. a technical fighter from Washington who has a lot of skills, not a lot of power. Uh, one of these two guys is going to come out of this fight in a much better position in his career. And that's what I like about it. Um, either Mike Reed is going to show I can – you know, I can beat guys on this level and I'm a threat or Ramirez is going to say, Hey, you know, I'm not just this crowd pleaser. I'm skilled. Um, kind of exciting for this fight. What, what are you looking for as these two people get in the ring? Well, uh, the first thing that you alluded to is that the fact that he's a draw and, you know, we are in Fresno, California. You, well, we clearly expect 10,000 or more people to be in this arena that night for a full night of boxing and, and the place, if you haven't been there in person or haven't been able to see it on a platform like ESPN, it's really going to come across as something special. That's the first part of it. As far as the fight itself, you know, we're really, uh, Mike Reed, when it was offered to him, it took literally five minutes to make. Brad Goodman made the match with his dad, Buck, and they had no hesitation. It's somebody that they always felt that they could beat because of his style and they just see something there that they can take advantage of. You know, we are sending them, you know, it is the hometown of, of Jose Ramirez, but we agreed that we would get neutral officials um, other than the referee and all to just, just, just have an even playing field. You know, you don't want to just send the kid in without, you know, some kind of even sure. playing field that will be there. And, and, you know, we'll get neutral officials for the fight. Um, and it's an interesting style. You know, I, I can't remember the last time. Jose Ramirez has fought this type of style. The question is, is Mike Reed going to be able to deal with the pressure and the right. local, you know, the local setting of, of it being a crazy atmosphere? We kind of think he can because if he didn't want to do it, he wouldn't have hesitated in taking the fight. He just would have sure. said, no, I'll fight him, but I don't want to fight in Fresno. The fact that it took, you know, five minutes to get a contract back just proves to the fact that he, this part, you know, he's passed and he's confident in his ability. And that's why we're even that much more looking forward to it. Um, It must be fun when fighters say yes, because I'm sure (laughs) you get that scenario where it doesn't happen. Uh, It must be great when you actually propose um, an intriguing fight and they both say yes. Does that happen a lot? I can't imagine that happens that much. It doesn't happen as much as it should. Um, But if you can just get to the mentality of, listen, it's okay to lose. You know, know, nothing's going to happen if you lose in a great effort, because nowadays, because of whatever reason you want to say, fighters are brought back and they should be because of the effort that they put forward. 
So just because you lose a fight, your your career shouldn't be condemned. All, all the fans are asking for in the media and I think promoters and everybody is just give the best effort you can. And regardless of the outcome, it's not going to stop you from getting another fight. I think what happens you know, is people want to protect an undefeated record or they're afraid of losing for whatever reason and, you know, because of this, because of that or whatever, you know, that that stuff just just doesn't work anymore and, and you just want, guys, it's okay if you win. We just want you to give your best fight. Don't worry, we're going to bring you back. We'd want to give you, we'd want to bring you back if that happens. So I think a lot of this, you know, on November 11th is what you're going to see and why, you know. Great. Um, Brandon, you have anything else for Carl? Uh, two quick things here for Carl. One, you know, uh, maybe you know, tell me if I'm a little bit off on this, but uh, Oscar Valdez is a guy who I just I, I'm falling in love with watching this guy fight, and the way I see you guys kind of promoting and bringing him along because he's going to be one of boxing's next big stars. Let's make no mistake about it. I see a lot of the same similarities in the way you guys are bringing him along, the way you brought along one of my favorite fighters of all time, Miguel Cotto. Uh, you know, what do you guys see in the future in regards to? Uh, Valdez, maybe the next time we can possibly see him back in action, and you know, you know, as far as building him as being that next star, uh, you know, what steps do you think he needs to take to really kind of get himself to that next plateau? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second part. Are you, is it all about Oscar Valdez and being the, the all next about guy? the great, all about Oscar? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, you know, first first thing you have to recognize is that. People want to see him fight. He's always going to make a good fight. All right, so whether it's on TV or in person, he is gaining viewership and fans every time he fights. You know, the Mariaga fight is a fight that was just tremendous in that, you know, I wish more people would have saw it, but, you know, we're past that. But he became a better fighter because of the Mariaga fight. The, the other part of it is, you know, nobody really knew Genesis Cervania. You know, because no one saw him fight in the United States, and why should they know? The next time Genesis Cervania fights, a lot of people are going to watch him. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, because we want to see him again and everything else. So, you know, it's just part of the progression of Oscar Valdez developing as a better fighter and being able to take on these challenges um, because of it. And Cervania will make him a better fighter. He'll be a bigger name. And, you know... It's, this isn't our first rodeo. We kind of know what we're doing, so we just bring him along as we see fit in the ring. I don't know. You know, you'll probably see him in the first quarter of next year. I'm not sure who he'll fight, but he's also in a great weight class and is probably eventually going to move to 130. So there's plenty of opponents and matchups to make. So that's not going to be a problem moving down the line. But you're right. He's fan friendly. Um, he's bilingual. Good looking kid, and he makes good fights. I mean, that's kind of the recipe to take when you're developing the next kid that you want to develop to that to the to the next level. Uh, absolutely now. And one more quick one. There is a rumor of Top Rank doing a card here Super Bowl weekend. Uh is there any truth to that? Anything you're looking to do with that? And could we possibly see the return of my pound for pound number one fighter Terrence Crawford on that card? Um, we are currently looking at all the potential dates for 2018. Um, I don't know if Crawford will be on that date, but I don't think if he's not on that date, he wouldn't be too far after that. Um, nothing's been determined by anybody yet as far as a site or who's going to fight on the card. It's literally what we're discussing today and this week and next week and everything like that as we plan towards 2018 um, and putting the whole schedule together. But that's you know, that's still up in the air. Uh, you know, it's a possibility, but there's nothing nothing concrete yet along those lines. Great. And, and Carl, last question uh, for from me. Um, you've had a number of uh, cards on ESPN now. What has been the early uh, returns in terms of uh, ESPN and how they viewed the partnership and the relationship? Uh, how have things been progressing on that end? Um, all positive feedback from every which way. Um, Great. I, I think if you if you see November and 11th, and especially December 9th, the the machine that it is will be in full force that week um, with all three guys, and uh, it's just a taste of what things are to come later on. Wonderful, uh, Carl. Thank you very much for jumping on. We really appreciate it, and uh, 
best of luck for the fights uh, in the rest yep. of the year and, and, and moving forward to 2018. Thanks to you guys for uh, for covering the sport and your enthusiasm, uh, you know, and covering all types of fights. We appreciate it and look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Okay. All right, Adam. So, uh, yeah. It's, no, it's a lot of good a lot stuff of good there from Carl. Yeah, a lot of good stuff there. Um, I I think, you know. Oscar Valdez, if you look at his career, perhaps another two or three years, uh, when he is perhaps one of the big names in boxing, you're going to look at his record in 2017, and you're going to see he fought Mariaga, and he fought Genesis Cervania, and neither of those names are going to pop out probably as the best people he's going to wind up fighting. But I think the point that Carl made is that it was a, a really special year for him in terms of development. He's learned that, that some people are going to be able to take his left hook. And you got to have to be able to do other things in boxing. And I think he showed that in the Cervania fight where, you know, in the last few rounds of the fight, he's boxing more. You know, he's no longer trying to kill Cervania. Cervania was actually the one that was hunting him. And so Valdez, in my opinion, was very impressive, showed he can box uh, in addition to slug it out. And I think that was a crucial learning experience. I I think the top-ranked people were surprised, too. I was in Nebraska, and I was asking about Cervania. They're like, you know, he's a guy. He's a capable guy, but, you know, Oscar should come out fine. I don't think they thought he was going to get dropped. Uh, I don't think they, they realized, uh, you know, Cervania was fighting uh, like a man possessed in that fight. I mean, Valdez deserved the win, but he had to earn it, and I think that was a great fight for Valdez. Yeah, absolutely, and you know it, it's great to hear that we're going to see him, you know, first quarter of 2018. But you know, one of the biggest things, especially on those last lines, Carl said that kind of kind of perked my ears a little bit. He said you're going to see the machine at work for the cards here in November and the cards here in December. Uh, you know, they've got a powerful backing behind them with ESPN, and I really hope you know with the machine being behind them, that these fights get pushed. And you know, once it's pushed, the fighters didn't have to go out and perform. So. That was interesting to hear and good to hear all in one because, uh, you know, this is what boxing needs. We need to get, you know, the good promoting of boxing and of real boxing fights. Let me make that clear. Uh, Being promoted by the machine that is ESPN. Right. And these are, you know, these are all legitimate fights, too. Um, You you know, we'll call it. I mean, they're fights that are bullshit. Top ranks had bullshit fights before, and they'll have bullshit fights again. These fights are fine. You know, they're all good. Um, I mean, I think Lomachenko is going to win that fight, but you know what? Like, nobody's taking Rigondeaux lightly. You know, nobody's saying, well, this guy has no shot. Rigondeaux has lost once in, like, 500 million fights, you know, as an amateur. And so, uh, I mean, you know what I mean, obviously. This is exaggeration. But, you know, <laughs> if you beat Rigondeaux and Lomachenko, I think, is going to win – you got to earn it. You know, you got to do something that Rigondeaux is uncomfortable with. You got to, you know, you have to be busy. You have to throw punches. You have to take risks. You have to be that fighter who wants to be great. And what we've seen against Rigondeaux as these fighters look at his movement and the way he moves his arms, the way he ducks in and out, he circles with his gloves. These fighters are not willing to take the risk to get hit with his left hand. And you got to be able to willing to do that. And Lomachenko is going to have to prove um, his ability level, meaning he's going to have to say, you know what, I am willing to eat these left hands. I'm willing to eat these clean power shots to go forward. And I think that will prove a lot. If he can impress upon Rigondeau that he's not going to be there to be uh, cowed to, that he's not going to be passive that he's going to be aggressive. I think that creates a, uh, that makes a big statement to the boxing world that I'm not your other opponents. You know, I'm here to become great and I'm going to win by beating you. Agreed. I mean, it, it could make for a very interesting fight. Uh, come November, uh, excuse me, come December. Um, I'm just glad it's happening. I'm glad, you know, for, you know, so often we see fighters shit talk each other on Twitter and fights never come about. This one's coming about, and it's going to be fun. Now, we have a couple more fights we want to get into here before the show is out. Um, let's stick in the month of November. November 25th, we have a very interesting fight, and Sergey Kovalev making his return 
uh, from back-to-back losses to Andre Ward, uh, facing uh, Wasaldi uh, Shabransky. Oh, uh, Shabransky, yeah. Why well, have to slap Shabransky? Um, we still have no clue who's going to train uh, Sergey Kovalev. Sounds like it may be himself now. On last week's show, our, my guest James Dominguez, who gave, gave a lot of insight in regards to uh, – Kovalev and saying, you know, really he was a weird guy to work around. Uh, he was around him uh, when, uh, um, when Sergey was getting ready for the wards, the first ward fight. Uh, he wasn't surprised that John David Jackson and, and him had a falling out, but said something interesting. He said both main events and um, uh, Sergey's management, they want somebody to be a disciplinarian to train him. And one of the names they brought up was Joel Diaz. Um, I, by the looks of it, that's not going to happen at least for this fight, but you know, going forward, could that be somebody who could actually work and could help Sergey as he tries to get his march back and gets goats back after titles uh, here uh, in 2018? I think it's really going to come down to who Kovalev respects, and Kovalev is going to um, want to have to be taught. And so, listen, there are, are fighters. If Kovalev just wants somebody to go through the motions and run a loose camp, I mean, he can go with Buddy McGirt. You know, or somebody like that. I mean, Buddy McGirt no, is not Buddy gonna... McGirt. His, his career is dead. Don't don't do that. To well, him. well, don't, I'm don't, just saying, don't like, match you know, that up. Don't do I, it. I hear I hear what you're saying, but like somebody that ilk. Like there are trainers who are kind of lax, and it's not like listen. Buddy McGirt knows boxing. It's not like Buddy McGirt is is an idiot. He just doesn't run. He is not the disciplinarian. So it really comes down to like what Kovalev wants. Does Kovalev want to be taught still? Does he respect somebody enough to want to be taught? I don't know those answers. And it sounds like, um, you know, I see both sides of that fight, of that argument with Kovalev and John Jack- and John David Jackson. Uh, I think Kovalev is really stubborn, uh, but I also think John David Jackson was, you know, was spread a little thin to me, it sounded like. And, uh, you know, and I, and I don't know if there was ever that, I know John David Jackson really hoped Co- really helped Kovalev. I know that he really did. But, you know, that might not have been a perfect match for a variety of reasons, and that's okay. Uh, Eddie Mustafa Muhammad is another trainer that comes to mind that could be very good uh, for Kovalev. I mean, there, there are a bunch of guys who are out there. It's really about, you know, how does Kovalev perceive himself? What does, does he think he's doing everything right and he was just a victim of these two fights, or does he really want to get better? So it's going to come down to his mindset and his mentality, and I don't have that answer. Do you think he's going to have enough answers or be able to get me mentally together uh, for Shabransky come November 25th, well, or could he yeah, be in that's, trouble? It, that's an interesting fight because Shabransky had a very good fight, uh, I believe, last year against Sullivan Barrera, where both fighters hit the deck. Uh, Shabransky is a golden boy guy, uh, and believe it or not, Shabransky was Bernard Hopkins's a chief sparring partner for Kovalev. So there's that small world aspect to it that uh, they're both familiar with each other. They've both kind of been around the circles for a while. Shabransky has some power. Uh, He's limited, but he has power. Um, So if Kovalev is not mentally prepared, he could get hit with something. It's possible. Um, I, I, I don't see any way that that fight's going 10 rounds. I believe that's a 10 round fight. Um, Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's the best opponent I've ever seen. I don't think it's the worst opponent. I think it is a barometer. Uh, Personally, I would have preferred to see Sullivan Barrera uh, as this opponent who's on, he's going to be on the undercard. I think it's, it is, it is a measuring stick. Um, It's okay. You know, it's okay. I'll watch it. I'll tape it. Um, I think I might have my 20th year high school reunion that night. So I may not be able to watch it live. (laughs) <laughs> but I will definitely yeah, – I'm going to whatever. I had a good time in high school. It was all right. Um, uh, it's okay. Don't hate. Don't hate. Me. And uh, what, you, you're too good for the reunion. That's fine. That's fine. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, I, it's okay. You know, I'm interested to see – it's kind of – it feels like it's a very quick comeback for Kovalev, doesn't it? Even though it's not. It just – with everything that's been going on, you know, with getting rid of the Jackson and what's going on with his camp – it seems like a very quick turnaround, doesn't it? It does, but then, you know, you got to look at the business side of boxing and, you know, main events kind of needs him to be there. I'm yeah. not shocked. I think it would be would have been better for him to maybe wait until maybe the, you know, end of January, February to kind of get back in there. But 
I get it, and I understand also as well, he probably wants to get the, the taste out of his mouth of losing the way he did uh, to Andre Ward. Um, I don't know if he's going to be any more motivated now that Ward's out of the division and out of the picture, but it'll be interesting to see how he evolves, especially with this fight and how he looks, but definitely how he evolves come 2018 with Ward out of the picture, belts are going to be vacated. I, I'm, I'm really interested to see how he evolves and, and what he turns into being. Because, you know, when you have adversity in front of you, it's how you react to that that shows if you've grown as a fighter and as a person. Uh, yeah. I also want to point out on that card, uh, Frank Galarza is another guy that main events recently signed here over the summer. Uh, he's going to be making this promotional debut for him as well here on November 25th. Um, yeah, and, and, I, and I really yeah. like uh, a, a fight that was talked about yesterday that is going to be announced soon is Jason Sosa against um, Robinson Castellanos. And Robinson Castellanos ha- had a very good performance uh, earlier in the year against Jezreel Corrales. A lot of people think he did enough to win that fight. Um, so I think that's a very good fight at 130. Jason Sosa has been competitive at, um, let's say, the A- minus B plus level at 130. I think that should be a wonderful television fight. Um, but going back to the main event, I do see Kovalev winning. I see him looking very sluggish. Uh, for a few rounds, and I think he just, you know, gets together. I, I see, like, uh, you know, seventh, eighth round KO uh, there in that fight. Actually, I, I agree there. I think it's going to be definitely kind of a filling out process for him early on, him getting his feet uh, back underneath him and getting his head kind of straight. And I see him probably starting to really turn it on the fourth, fifth round, and then after that it's going to be just pretty much elementary uh, for him to get it done and get him out of there. Now, uh, yeah. We're going to talk a couple quick fights here in December before we go. Uh, granted, it's technically not fall anymore, I think, or is it? I don't know. I don't know when the first day of winter is. All I don't know is it just gets cold. Um, in December, yeah. we got, you know, Miguel Cotto is going to have his final fight. It's scheduled for New York, Madison Square Garden, December 2nd. We don't know it gets who yet. So I'll reserve judgment for that. You know, as a Cotto fan, I'm very indifferent about that. So once it gets booked, I'll talk about that more extensively. Uh, but a fight that they actually had the press conference for today, uh, Tony Ballou and uh, Below, or how do you know his name, um, David Hay Part 2, uh, the fight no one wants but we're going to get. Is it going to be any different the second time around? Well, I won't say nobody wants it. Um, I won't say nobody wants it. I mean, it's it's going to be a big pay-per-view fight in England, and um, which means whatever that means. Um the, they're both uh, – Hay does big business in England. He was a television star, you know, reality television star. Uh, Tony uh, Bellow is a great talker and obviously has moved up the ranks from like a B-plus uh, guy at light heavyweight to somehow winning a cruiserweight title to now be knocking out David Hay. Um, He's a cash if you watch cow. The, it was weird. If, if you watch the first fight, David Hay was doing very well and dominating the fight, and then suddenly his Achilles went. And eventually he was fighting on one leg. He literally was fighting on one leg. And uh, Tony uh, Bellu just kept hammering away. Tony Bellu doesn't have a heavyweight punch, but he kept hammering away, hammering away, and the fight eventually got stopped. And, uh, you know, credit to Bellu. That's why people get in the ring. These things happen, you know. Um, Everybody has a shot. And um, I, I talked to some people from England, and I said, I would be a lot happier if this fight got pushed back another three or four months to give Hay more time to heal because you know how serious an Achilles injury is. And they all said Hay needs money. You know, he really needs money. For whatever's going on in his life, he had, a, I think, a divorce. He, he, he lives a very extravagant lifestyle. He needs money. So I don't think he's going to be fully healthy. I know from baseball and from football – how long it takes people to come back from Achilles. You're talking nine months, 12 months, 15 months sometimes. I, you know, Hay was so much better than Bello. It's actually an intriguing fight because of the injury. That's the only reason why it's intriguing. Because if they were on even terms, Hay wins this fight easily. But he's not. He, he's going to have, I don't know, 60% mobility, 50% mobility. Can Tony Bello win? He could win that fight. So, I'm picking Bello to win because I, I hate going with a fighter who's injured. But if if Hay is somehow close to normal, you know, he should win the fight. Well, it's going to be like we saw with Miguel Cotto and Sergio Martinez. Yes, it um, is. And, I have, right and, and it's going to be kind of – it may be sad to watch because we could be seeing a guy that we know 
has the skill set and has the ability in David Hay, you know, he wouldn't come to Sergio Martinez, but just physically doesn't have the tools to get it done. And, you know, the, it has to be a money thing for him to come back this quickly off any sort of Achilles injury. Those do not heal fast at all. Um, it, it's a sad state, but I, I think, you know, Tony's going to probably pull it out again, and we're going to see David Hay hobbling around midway through the fight, and it's going to be kind of tough to watch. So, I mean, it could be a mercy killing by the referee stopping the bout, seeing that, you know, they have a guy that's injured and can't continue on. Uh, but it, it's weird, it, very odd uh, that we're getting it this soon. But it is what it is. U.K. fans will eat it up, and uh, I can tell by the press conferences already this is going to be entertaining as far as trash talking goes. So, you know, best of luck to both the guys. You know, I'll, I'll catch it here in December uh, just because it kind of has that almost like a train wreck value to it. You want to look over and see, what you're, see what's going on. We also, before we leave, have a couple other things to talk about. There's the continuation of both tournaments of the World Boxing Super Series. And so far, I've been very pleased with the quality of fights. We haven't had any upsets yet, but we saw an amazing knockout with uh, Dordikos um, uh, in, the, in the cruiserweight division. We had a good fight with Usyk and Huck. Um, uh, we had a 168-pound division. Callum Smith had a pretty good fight. Um, so... Um, that's going to continue. There is Chris Eubank fighting this weekend, which is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I, I enjoy him. He's actually my favorite to win the 168 pound division. That's an upset pick. So who knows? Um, we also have a couple of fights that may be announced the next week. Uh, it could be for December or January. We're looking at uh, Earl Spence against Lamont Peterson. And we're looking at Danny Garcia against Brandon Rios. Let's save the Danny Garcia, Brandon Rios fight. We know that it is. It's bullshit. Danny Garcia doesn't want to fight real opponents, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we've seen this story before. I don't really think we need to go over that more than it is. Um, the Spence Peterson fight is intriguing. Uh, Peterson, by any definition, is a top 10 guy in the division. Uh, he's given everybody except Matisse a tough fight. Um, I'm not sure Spence has seen that style before. Uh, somebody who's comfortable fighting both inside and outside. Uh, Spence will be the favorite there. Um, what do you, if this fight gets made, how do you see it? You know, this is going to be one of those fights. It's kind of an, uh, an ugly style that Peterson can kind of, kind of bring his opponent into. And I don't like Spence's chance in that, oddly enough. Really? Um, I would pick Peters. I would pick Peterson to win. Now, the reasoning behind that is that I don't know if Spence has had enough experience with guys like you say who can be so versatile like that. And you know, minus the Matisse fight from Peterson, you've really never seen him in a really trash bout or really look bad out there. So I don't know. You know, my preliminary thoughts would be with Peterson winning this. Uh, but, you know, Spence has proved me wrong again. And, and again, it's going to be kind of like I said with Eric Lubin earlier. Even in a, if he were to lose this fight against Peterson, if it gets made, he can learn and grow so much from it. Win or lose, this is going to be one of those fights where he's going to be able to gain so much knowledge and be so much better of a fighter after the fight than what he was going into the fight. So it would be, it's going to be a great fight for his progression regardless whether he wins or loses. I like Spence by knockout, like eighth or ninth round, and I think ultimately his clean punching and body punching are going to really affect Peterson. But I think it's going to be a war. I think it's going to be a war of attrition that I think Spence will eventually win. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be a fantastic fight to watch. It might be a very rough and brutal and, you know, scrappy fight. Uh, but I think it's very physical. Um, I'm not sure – you know, Peterson is is going to want to take it inside to test Spence, but I'm not sure he's going to like what's coming back. And uh, and I, I think uh, Spence is going to go to town with that left hand of the body, and I think that is going to cause a lot of damage. And I'm that's that I think that's going to be a really rough fight. And uh, I, either way, great learning opportunity for Spence. If it happens, I'm sure we'll have ample time to talk about it more in the future. Uh, but that is uh, that's a good fight. I wish it was already happening. Spence has been out of the ring enough, but uh, you know, better that and it's Peterson happening as well. than that it's not. Yep, very much so. So, uh, yeah, and one more one more kind of throwaway fight that we forgot to mention before we go: uh, Gabriel Rosado versus Glenn Tapia. That's going to be actually here in, in roughly two weeks on ESPN. It's a Golden Boy card. Um, 
pretty much this is going to be the eliminator of brain cells and gatekeeper. Um, <laughs> it's a brain so cell eliminator. what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of, the winner will go on and continue to be a gatekeeper and lose more brain cells going forward on ESPN for Golden Boy. The loser, well, we don't know what they'll be relocated to, but um, it, it's gonna it, it, it's a garbage fight that's going to be fun to watch because it's just going to be so bad. And you're going to feel so awful for the guys involved, but you're not going to be able to stop watching it. Um, on that same token, uh, uh, he- Jesus Soto Carras also fights for Golden Boy here in a couple of weeks as well. Another one of those fights that he really probably shouldn't continue to be fighting, but it is what it is. Yeah, you know, and, and all this shows to me is um, I don't like the Tapia Rosado fight for reasons you've you gone into. I just don't like it. Uh, I mean, I might, I might watch it, but I, I don't like it. Um, but it just goes to show you that, you know, Golden Boy has a stable of younger fighters that are coming up. And why the ESPN deal was so important for them is that they needed more exposure for these guys. But what it shows you right now is that they don't have enough guys to even headline smaller shows. And so they're relying on the Glenn Tapias of the world and Gabriel Rosado and Jesus Soto Carras because they just don't have that next level funneling up yet. So, you know, with these dates, they will be getting people that have more familiarity in boxing fans. They're going to create more buzz, but they're not there yet. And, you know, and and it it goes to show you, um, you know, when they got – they had an FS1 uh, platform a couple years ago before PBC kicked them off. Um, you know that hurt them. You know I know they were still doing fights in Estrella TV and whatever, but it hurt them. They didn't have the ability to uh, in, invest in their younger fighters the same way, build them the same way, give them the type of opponents that they need, uh, build the profile. So they're still needing to develop these guys. You know, bring them up, and you know they're still. I'd say six to 12 months away from having a consistent young stable of fighters that people are excited about, excited about. I think they have a few, but they need more of them. Hello, Brandon. Are you on mute? Hello. Sorry about that, folks. I disconnected. No. So, Block Talk oh, okay. was kicking me off seconds before the show ended. But with that being stated, uh, you know, this was our fall fight preview. We want to thank, definitely yeah. thank uh, Carl Moretti, VP of Boxing Ops, for Frank for uh, calling in and joining us. Um, unfortunately, I don't know where Austin Trout is, so I do apologize for fans who are listening to the show. Hopefully, yeah. to see Austin Trout or hear him. It's also, it's uh, also not boxing. Yeah, it's also boxing, and that happens. I mean, you know, people don't show. I mean, it happens. It happens. So no hard feelings there. I'll reach out to his people, maybe get him rescheduled, maybe after the fight. Uh, so you never know. So we'll always keep that door open and have him on as a welcome guest. Um, oddly enough, we had no callers and no angry tweets. So that means when people replay the show, probably going to get some angry tweets come tomorrow morning. But we'll see. It is what it is. Um, you know, Adam, uh, anything you want to say in closing before we go? Yeah, um, I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but the people who are listening out there. I just did a two-part interview with Jack Reese, the referee from California. I think he had some fantastic insights about fighter safety, um, about referee technique, about how his growth in the sport. Uh, it's up on my website, SaturdayNightBoxing.com. Uh, I, I really felt like it came out well. Uh, you could also uh, follow me on SN Boxing on Twitter. I have a Facebook page, SN Boxing. And as usual, Brandon, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Man, as always, I I appreciate you joining the show, and, and I, I can't say this, you know, I say this enough at the end of every show, and I genuinely mean it this week because, you know, the events that happened in Las Vegas just broke my heart here from over the weekend, and it's somewhere that I, I frequent a lot, and, and I, I love the city, I call it a second home, but it's the fight capital. So I, I can't stress this enough, and I say this, you know, with the most heartfelt meaning. Uh, I want everyone to stay safe, stay blessed, love one another, and that's the only way we're going to get through any of this here in life. So with that being stated, this is Punch to the Face Radio, and I am out. 